It's pretty clear that your mother cares about where a person is from, Ned said. Pearl Ann grimaced. Who is it you want to take on the carousel, me or my mother? Ned dug in his heels and didn't answer. I see. Well, be careful going round and round on the carousel. Mother is prone to nausea. Pearl Ann marched away from Ned and her mother. Hey, Benedetto, a young man snatched the paisley fabric from Ned's pocket. You getting your quilt square ready for the victory quilt? It was Lance Devlin, the mine owner's son, with a couple of his buddies. Well, it's good to see you're doing your part for the war effort. The boys who normally sported their high school letter sweaters were dressed in a smart brown military uniforms and jaunty hats. They formed a half circle around Ned. Going to a costume ball, Ned said, still smoldering. You didn't hear? We signed up to do our bit. After all, somebody's got to go over and fix the mess you folks got themselves into over there. I didn't know the Army was so desperate that they've lowered their requirements in intelligence as well as age. You mean because I haven't had my 18th birthday yet? Lance asked. Yeah, well, it's amazing how $25 can help a recruitment officer overlook a thing or two. Maybe you should try it, Ned, old boy. But then, company vouchers might not do the trick. You're right about that. The Devlin vouchers aren't worth the paper they're written on. Tut tut, Ned. You should be relieved that you won't see me on the track this spring. Oh, I am relieved, Ned rubbed his neck. I strained my neck last year running against you in the mile. Really? Lance looked a little bit pleased as well as surprised. Yeah, from craning my neck to see how far behind you were. The other boys in uniform snickered behind their hands. Lance Devlin got his face up close to Ned's and tucked the paisley fabric back into Ned's pocket. Well, for now you'd better just stitch up your little quilt square and leave the fighting to us. Then again, maybe we should check to make sure you're not stitching in some kind of spy message. You can never be too careful around those of unknown heritage, and your heritage is about as unknown as it gets. Isn't that right, Benedetto? Lance stepped back and spoke loudly. For all we know, that might not even be your real name. Maybe it's Fritz or Hans. Come on, fellas. He bumped Ned's shoulder in passing. Jinx walked up with some warm biscuits. What was that all about? Nothing. Ned stole a glance at the army recruitment stand. So a con is the art of distraction, huh? Yes, you are reconsidering my little pyrotechnic plan? Ned squared his shoulders. Sign me up. The 1st of December rolled around and all the quilt squares had been turned in, except one. But the deadline is today, the Hungarian woman shook her quilt square, her bracelets jangling. I'm sure you must have misread. Eudora Larkin peered through the screen door of her home. The deadline has passed and the quilt is full. Besides, as president of the DAR, it is my responsibility to ensure the suitability of anything going before the president of the United States. Involvement of someone of your profession would be inappropriate, to say the least. My profession, the woman said, challenging her. Well, yes, you know, a, a fortune teller, a caster of spells and curses. Curses, the woman repeated, her eyes blazing. Keep your victory quilt. I give you a curse. She pulled open the screen door. Ava graz budel noka mol. Mrs. Larkin stepped back, cowering as the screen door slammed shut. Then trying to regain her composure, she said, oh, for heaven's sake, it's all poppycock. She watched the woman walk away. Poppycock, I tell you. Mrs. Larkin was so distressed by the woman's curse that by New Year's Eve, she had dark circles under her eyes and was of an overall irritable disposition. During the weeks leading up to the New Year's festivities, Jinx and Ned were busy collecting empty cans and filling them with ingredients gathered from sources as varied as the hardware store, bakery, and mine supply. After word had gotten out that the coveted Manchurian fire throwers were for sale, Jinx and Ned knew they could sell as many as they could make. The abandoned mine shaft Shady used for mixing hooch became a convenient hideout for a new Shady endeavor. It was located on the long, narrow stretch of land owned by the widow Kane that ran alongside the mine. The shaft had been abandoned years before when Devlin's geologists had figured out, had figured that the heart of the coal vein would be found farther west. For Jinx and Ned, it was a secluded area perfect for making fireworks. Jinx carefully emptied black powder from his pockets into a large can. 
Whoa, Hungarian olives. Ned read the label on the oversized canister. Those must be some olives. Yeah, I've been helping the Hungarian woman with some fence work and she gave me this one. It'll be just the right size for the last of the TNT. Otis, at the mine, said even though a bottle of Shady's Hooch for two po pockets of TNT is a bargain, he can't risk Burton finding out. Ned shrugged. I wouldn't worry about it. Burton, Devlin, the whole mine has no trouble blasting through anything or anyone who gets in their way. Jinx looked sideways at Ned. He'd been awful moody of late. Ned must have noticed Jinx looking at him because he said, How'd you learn all this stuff? The shell game, the art of distraction, arctic glacial water. And don't tell me you picked it up from a hundred-year-old medicine man. Jinx shrugged without looking up. I guess it started a couple of years ago when my mom got sick. My dad took off when I was little, so I was, it was just my mom and me living in a one-room apartment in Chicago. We did okay for a while. She took in sewing and laundry, but when she got sick, my Uncle Finn, my dad's brother, said he could help me make some money for food and medicine. He taught me all kinds of tricks of the trade. Then, when my mom died, it was either end up in an orphanage or go with Finn. He took me on with him, kind of as his assistant. And? Ned wasn't dumb. He knew that Jinx had come to manifest on the run, but until now, he had never pressed him for an explanation. Jinx was tired. The canister felt heavy in his hands. He set it down, wanting to unburden himself. It was a mediocre con at best. Usually it was missions and tent revivals that worked like a charm because people, could, because people came looking for something and we'd provide it. But you'd have to have a mole, someone not known to be associated with Finn. Jinx took a breath. It was the mole. I'd have some malady and Finn was the person with the cure for what ailed me. Sometimes I'd be blind, other times crippled, but it was always something that would be visible to everyone there. Then, when Finn came along, he'd tell the folks about his elixir or balm that was a time-honored remedy from the natives of the Jambezi jungle or a special mixture prepared by a hundred-year-old Indian medicine man. He'd ask for a volunteer to try the stuff. I'd hold back and wait for someone to volunteer me. It was always best if they came up with the idea themselves. A hundred-year-old medicine man, huh? Ned said. I knew it. Jinx grinned. Yeah, so I'd drink it or rub it on, depending on what my ailment was. Then, with no small bit of drama, I'd be healed. Folks couldn't get their wallets out fast enough to buy a bottle or two. But isn't that nothing more than lying and cheating and stealing? Ned asked. I guess I never looked at it that way. That's what Finn did, and I was with Finn. Jinx grew silent, knowing that his answer had fallen flat. Go on, said Ned. Well, there was a tent revival in Joplin. They were usually loud and raucous, with lots of shouting and arm-waving in one part praise and two parts damnation. But this one was different. The preacher was quiet and gentle. He spoke like a neighbor chatting over the fence. He talked of how he'd done things in his life he wasn't proud of, said he'd had sadness and hardship that he had, that had left him wandering. Then he decided he didn't want to wander anymore. He started singing and others joined in. Jinx rested his hands on his knees. That song was about green pastures and restful waters. The preacher talked about walking in the valley of the shadow of death and not being afraid. Jinx grew quiet, reliving the memory. I'd never heard anything so nice. All Finn ever told me was that if it wasn't for him, I'd be dead or in an orphanage someplace where they feed the kids rats soup and make them scrub toilets all day and night. So I let that preacher's words linger in my head and found myself wishing I could be in one of those green pastures instead of always sneaking into one town and hightailing it out of another. But pretty soon the service was over and Finn had to do his act and I had to get healed. Everything went off like usual until Finn and me were in the woods outside of town. The abandoned mine shaft, se mine shaft seemed to fade away as Jinx revealed his story. Finn was counting the money by the fire when a man sauntered into our campsite. Hey there, Finn, he said through buck teeth. Long time no see. I sat up thinking Finn would be surprised, but he didn't act like it. Hey, Junior, he said without looking up. Finn just counted the rest of his money and stuffed it into his pocket. I've been living just up the road with my Aunt Louise, got my eye on a girl in town. Finn didn't answer. I saw you at the revival, Junior said, sitting down at the fire. Yeah, I saw you too. Boy, we had some times, didn't we, Finn? 
Remember that job we did in St. Louis down at the freight house? We left those boys knowing who was boss, didn't we, Finn? That was a two-bit hack job, Junior. It didn't take any brains to clonk a couple guys on the head and steal their hat and shoes. No, sir, I'm a confidence man now. Paying for high stakes these days. Nothing you'd be capable of. Junior nodded. This is your new partner, he motioned to me. Yep, he's younger than you, but smarter. Junior just smiled a goofy smile. Maybe you're right, Finn, but I've kind of fallen on hard times lately, and I could use a little hand up if you know what I mean. More like a hand out. That's what you mean, isn't it, Junior? Finn's voice was hard and mean. Well, you can forget it. Now go on. Get out of here. Junior stood and walked over behind Finn. Folks around here wouldn't be too happy to know you cheated them out of their church money. Finn stood up. You threatening me, Junior? Finn's face cracked into a strange smile. Go on. Tell the sheriff you've captured the notorious outlaw who sells fake elixir. He'll laugh in your face. Besides, by the time you get back to town, I'll be halfway to who knows where. Junior pulled a knife from his vest pocket, his hands shaking. Maybe so, but if I take you into town and I tell them I've got the man who killed that banker's son in Kansas City, I think they might be real interested. Finn froze. So much for honor among thieves, eh, Jinx? It happened not long after my mother died. Finn and me were living in a flea bag apartment in Kansas City. He'd been out all night drinking and gambling when he stormed in and told me to grab my things. We were leaving. I never knew why until Junior shed some light on what had sent us packing. I remember t thinking two things as I sat by the fire, watching this scene play out. One was that I felt sorry for Junior, and two, I didn't want to be like him, wandering in the valley of the shadow of death, because that was what I'd be doing with Finn. In one move, Finn wrenched the knife from Junior's hand and twisted his arm behind his back. Junior winced in pain. I was just funnin' with you, Finn. I wouldn't have turned you in. Jinx, get a rope. Just let him go and let's get out of here, I said. What's your hurry, boy? You afraid of me now? Finn said. I didn't answer. Finn threw the knife, planting it in the ground right in front of my feet. I'll give you something to be afraid of. His eyes were like smoldering coals as he held on to Junior. Now go cut a piece of rope in the bag over there. I pulled a long rope from the bag and cut off a section. Finn shoved Junior to the ground. Tie him up. Junior cowered on the ground. Come on, Finn. I didn't mean nothing. I walked towards Junior, still carrying the knife and rope, trying to figure out what to do. Finn was rustling around the campsite, grabbing his belongings. Maybe he wouldn't notice if I did a haphazard job on the tying. I wrapped the rope loosely around Junior's hands and tied it off in a slip knot that could be easily undone. Then I picked up the knife and stood facing Junior. I whispered, get your hands free while you're wear packing and go. Junior didn't answer. He just looked past me with fear in his eyes. I knew that Finn was behind me and I knew he'd heard. I, heard, I turned just in time to meet Finn's fist as it came crashing into my face. The last thing I remember was the gleaming knife in my hand. I couldn't have been out long, but when I came to, I was lying beside Junior with blood all over me. The knife had gotten him right in the stomach. Finn knelt to examine Junior, then looked at me. You killed him, he shook his head. Boy, you are some kind of jinx. I was just going to tie up Junior here and leave him in the woods until he we was gone. Now look what you done. I did look, long and hard. Yes, sir, there's a shadow of bad luck all over you. First your daddy leaves, then your mama dies. Now poor stupid Junior. He took the knife. I must be the only... I must be the only one free of your hoodoo back bad luck. He looked at me with a combination of disgust and pity. I guess you'll have to stick with me, he said, wiping the blade with his handkerchief. Otherwise, you might end up bringing luck, bad luck to your own self. I was scared. 